I'm on a journey to get better, and I want to do it with you. And I'm not just focusing on physical health. I'm focusing on everything, emotional wellness, spirituality, finances, relationships, and so much more. Every week, it will be my personal goal to bring us, the world's leading healers, experts, and game changers, to share groundbreaking secrets and tips to getting better in all areas of life. Getting better isn't easy, but it's a whole lot easier when we can do it together. Welcome to Better Together with me, Maria Manu. Welcome to Better Together. It is Tuesday, April 21st. Welcome to the show, everybody. Um, Our quote of the day comes from our guest who I'm so excited for. I'm like so, so excited for our guest. Okay. Whether you've seen angels floating around your bedroom or just found a ray of hope at a lonely moment, Choosing to believe that something unseen is caring for you can be a life-shifting exercise. That is by Martha Beck. I'm going to choose to believe that those things I saw the other night that I tweeted about were UFOs. The UFOs? And that I could have boarded one of those alien ships. No! Don't board <laughs> the alien ship, Maria. We need you. I can't believe we haven't talked about this. Would you pull know, a Gary Shanice? remembering. There's a, there's a Mars movie, I think it's Gary Sinise at the end, uh-huh. makes the decision to leave leave Earth behind. I would totally go in and a second. And he goes with the aliens on Mars to explore the universe. I would go in one second. The only thing that would make me sad is losing Max. <laughs> so That sounds wow. horrible. <laughs> bye, parents. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Max. <laughs> My God. Damn. <laughs> cold. That was cold. Super cold. Um, no, I... I would go in a second, but okay. So here's what happened. Uh, it was over the weekend, I believe. I don't remember what day, probably Sunday. I think maybe, I don't know. Anyhow, I go into the backyard and I always look up at the sky. I love looking at stars. It's my favorite thing to do. And unfortunately living in California, we really don't have stars in LA because of the smog. But another benefit of the pandemic is the fact that we are not polluting as much so you can actually see the stars. And so I looked up and I mean, guys, we talked about this yesterday. I can find a needle in a haystack. Like I'm really good at finding stuff. Maybe it wasn't yesterday, but whatever recently. Um, I saw there was like one big bright star. If it was a star, I don't know. It could have been a planet for all I know. Venus probably. It's like super bright lately. Super bright. And it's like just above our hedges, right? Like our big trees. And so then I saw like a dot, like a star slowly going diagonal above it. And then I see another one and I'm like, wow, that's so weird that they would allow two planes to fly on the same flight pattern. Like I'm thinking they're planes that are so far away. They look like stars. And then I see another one following it. And I'm like, holy shit what's going on and i'm like screaming for kevin he's busy he could care less this stuff does not get him excited at all so he's like i'm writing anyway i call my neighbor and i was like ashley i know this is going to be really hard because you really have to look closely but go outside or come over here whatever i need you to see what i'm seeing so luckily she saw what i was seeing So you're both using CBD cream? (laughs) So at that moment, I'm like, okay, another normal human is seeing the same thing I'm seeing. I am tweeting this out like right now. So I start tweeting like, is anyone else seeing this in the sky? So then Sean Waltman, X-Pac from the WWE, responds to me. He's like, I went outside. I see the same thing. And it was just like a constant stream. Like maybe it was like 40 seconds after one, one after the other, right? And I'm like, where are they going? It's just this diagonal thing up into the sky and then it would disappear. Then my neighbor's husband comes out and then he's saying, I see it too. So all of us in the neighborhood and I'm begging people who has binoculars. I need to see your binoculars. I want to see what's going on. My neighbor's freaking out. She's like, I've dreamed of seeing UFOs. We're freaking out. Then all of a sudden I'm like, I have to try to take video or something, but it was really hard to be on the phone and do all this stuff at the same time. And I didn't want to miss anything because I just was like, what if there's some alien explosion up there? And I need to be looking up. I can't be looking down trying to fiddle with my phone. So then um, then at some point they stopped. And I was like, what the heck did we just see? And what is going on? And then my neighbor texts me. 
Logan Paul has video. So Logan Paul's been on the show. He's he's in the neighborhood as well. And he had the most insane video where you he's him and his friends he's quarantining with, and they're, you know, 25 and they're hilarious. Oh my god, dude, what is that? And they're like screaming, and then one of the like star things or whatever it was that was climbing literally lit up and got big and everyone's freaking out. I'm screaming. We're all going crazy. It was pretty intense. And then of course on Twitter, I keep seeing people say it's space link or SpaceX or whatever. They're setting satellites for the internet up. And I'm like, not going to choose to believe that I am going to do what Martha Beck, our guest who is life coach, uh, sociologist, and so much more. She's also Oprah's life coach, FYI, or was, we'll find out if she currently still is. I'm going to choose to believe that something unseen is creating this life shifting situation. I have an article on this, Maria. What? Are you ready? Oh, you're going to burst my bubble. I'm going to burst your bubble. Oh, if you've on. looked up at the night sky recently, you might have been surprised to see a train of bright lights moving across from one side to the other. What's going on? The lights appear in groups of up to 60 in a long line. There have been numerous reports from places like the U.S. and U.K. of people seeing them with mm-hmm. explanations ranging from UFO to an alien invasion. Fear not, these lights are actually satellites launched into space by the U.S. company SpaceX. The satellites are part of something called Starlink. This is a project by SpaceX to launch thousands of satellites into orbit and beam the Internet to Earth from space. SpaceX (laughs) hopes to use this to fund the mission to Mars. So using global Internet to fund the mission to Mars. But... But there is, a, there is another imagina- imaginative thing tonight that I want you to know about that I've been looking forward to for four months now. What? The Lyrid meteor shower is tonight. It peaks tonight. Wow. It's been going on for about 20 days now. I've been seeing it on Twitter, and I didn't know what it was. So it is, it is another meteor shower coming close to Earth, but here's the great news. This is the first time in, a few, in like a year or two that we've had a meteor shower in L.A., that peaks on a night of a new moon. So if mm-hmm. you go out to like, I like to go out to Malibu State Park, mm-hmm. or if you go out to somewhere where you don't have light pollution, maybe Calabasas or something, and look up, you'll see probably one or two every minute or so. And what does that look like? Just dropping? Oh, no, they're shooting stars. You see like <gasps> fireballs. Oh, my God, I got the chills all the way down my body. You'll see like <clears> literally <throat> the last time there was a new moon and I went out to see the meteor shower, I laid on my back in the Prius and looked up through the window. And for like four hours straight, it was just... Some of them super bright. Some of them went straight down and just turned into fireballs. And then just like all of them streaking across the sky. Tonight at midnight, I'm probably going out to Malibu. I have to stay up till midnight. I'll go with you. Yeah? Do you yeah. guys want to make like a thing of it? I would go. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I mean, we can't go to a park if it's, you're not. <laughs> then we'll get kicked out like well, Tom a, Brady, which a we'll park, talk about. There's like a ground floor parking lot that I think is still open. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Have to have to i have to see this first of all um i am psycho stargazer so i just want to know because i feel like a lot of my success has been either attributed to and we can ask martha about this shooting stars i've wished on or being pooped on by birds (laughs) both are known to make things come true right so i want to know steven your professional advice if i wish on these meteors that are going to be flying through the sky is it the same as wishing on a star? Um, I don't want to rain on your parade, so I won't talk. <laughs> you ruin my life <laughs> every day. Steven. I'm just telling you that most shooting stars aren't stars. They're just debris burning up in the atmosphere. Okay, so then it will count. Yeah, so it's the equivalent, it worked before. It's the equivalent of space bird shit falling on you. It's the space, space shit falling on Earth. Bird shit. Dead. It's space Only shit s- falling on Earth. Only Stephen Lemieux would compare the miracle of a meteor shower to space bird shit falling hey, on all of us. I'm yeah. the one who knew about the meteor shower, guys. I get You're so right. excited You're by right. star stuff. I love space. It's I so stare right. up into You're space right. for like an hour a week. I mean, if I someone it. came right now and said, okay, if, if Elon Musk was like, listen, Maria, I have a spaceship and we're going to be fine. I promise you, like, I made the Tesla. We're going to get there. We're going to go. I just don't know if we're going to come back. Go where? To space. Oh, to space. Got it. Yeah. Um, I would totally go in a second. I would just make sure I brought like a good comfy pillow, some blankets and like, you know, my food. I mean, one of my goals for like actually becoming wealthy is being able to afford a trip to space once in my life. Oh, for sure. Like a hundred percent. And I think in the next 20 years, it's going to be pretty commercially available. You think within 20 years? Within 20 years, I think you can go to space for a hundred grand. Wow. 
too bad. Like we I would all say lost all our money in the probably market. within ten years. Honestly, <laughs> I'd say I by by twenty thirty, you can go to space for hundred grand. I have a good friend who works at SpaceX, and she's a female, one of the like ten percent of women at that company. And no she way. She lost her job, and um, she lost her yeah. job. She loves her job. Oh. Loves it. And um, yeah, she what works does on, like, SpaceX do? SpaceX is Elon Musk's private space exploration company. Oh. So basically, uh, with space exploration, NASA kept getting its funding cut because obviously space does not do much for our government in terms yeah. of anything other than research. Uh, and that's a lot of people really, really, really hate Trump for the whole Space Force thing. Because it's like such a funny name and they literally copied the Star Trek logo. But like, guys, take that $1.5 trillion budget for the military and cut a little slice away for space exploration. I'll take any excuse for that to happen. So Elon has developed through SpaceX the ability for rockets to not completely disintegrate. Basically, we have rockets that can now take a run up to the atmosphere and then land. So you don't lose the capsule and the engine pod. Mm. So it's... It's cut down on the cost. It's economical. Of, yeah. So there's lots of things going on because really the next step in uh, in human space travel is setting up some kind of pad on the moon because right now most of the cost comes from the rocket fuel to get into the atmosphere. But launching something off of the moon where the gravity is slim to none is so much cheaper and it's easier to build up. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to go off Earth, slingshot around the moon to get the momentum to get somewhere, now you could launch directly from the moon. I just wonder, right? Like we do so much research and all of that. How do we research what creates a brain like Elon Musk so mm -hmm. that that can be replicated, right? Like what genes, DNA, what, like, what creates a brain like that, where you're actually figuring out how to get into space, how to make it economical, how to like, you know, how to do all of this. It's crazy. And well, it's so, the fact that he's conquered so many like Tesla space, you know, he's building these hyperloop trains that can yeah. get you from LA to San Francisco in like 20 minutes. Yeah. It's, it's, because not only is he a genius in one area, he's a genius in all these different areas. Well, here's yeah. the here's the thing with Elon, which I think is is kind of cool, is he wasn't he didn't actually make his money in tech research. No, wasn't it in the it credit was PayPal. card? Yeah, PayPal. He created yeah. he sold PayPal for tons of money, and then got into developmental research in a lot of these different areas. And I don't think that he's like. The I don't think he's actually as like intelligent as everyone like says. Not in the way of like saying he's not intelligent. I just mean like he's somebody who knows how to spend his money on researchers who know what they're doing. And I think that's super valuable. Where he's probably not an expert in all these different fields. He just knows how to find people who are and empower them to get the, like that's what Steve Jobs I've had did a really three, well. Probably a three-hour conversation with him once at a party. Like literally, wow. we just kept talking and talking and talking. He's pretty freaking smart. Sorry, I didn't mean my <laughs> quote to say he's not intelligent. I know, I, I know. Yeah. I just people think of him like this super genius. I'm like, no, I think he's just a really. I think he's a super genius, Stephen. Probably, probably. I think he's genius. a super genius, and yes, he knows how to bring other super geniuses together. But he's a freaking super genius. Trust me, but um, I, I, Jeff, would you go into outer space? You know, this is a funny thing. I have very few fears. I love heights. I love small spaces. I'm like you into love animals. small spaces. Yeah, you know, I like caving and like spelunking. Like I like that experience. Okay, Jeff, like you're gonna be in the booth so much more after this show. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. But I have this crazy phobia of aliens. Really? Really? Is, yeah. Ever since I was a little kid, that's the thing I'm afraid of. If weird lights come into my room at night, I'd like run to my parents. Um, I think it might be from seeing M. Night Shyamalan's movie Signs. Signs had some good scenes that really huh. tripped you up as a kid. Jeff, I'll, yeah. I'll confirm for you right now, we're not that interesting, so aliens would have no reason to look at us. <laughs> but wouldn't it have been the perfect time for aliens to invade us, right? We're in the middle of this global pandemic, and they're like, out with you guys, we're taking over. This is Oof. the stuff that I was thinking that night. This is mm. what scares me. Though. No, it's, so funny. it's like my one phobia. <laughs> the scary thing to think about would be, what if aliens have been eyeing us for so long that global warming isn't actually caused by us, it's caused by their secret terraforming machines deep in the crust, and they're actually just secretly terraforming the planet to suit their own needs. And on that note, <laughs> let's talk about Tom Brady. Um, 
<laughs> segue from aliens to Tom Brady. Yeah. Is that your how other... far he's fallen after leaving the Patriots? Guys, so he apparently went to a football field or some park in Tampa to practice and he got kicked out, which was kind of funny. <laughs> um <laughs> I understand the the need to get out there and do something and and move and um you know wanting to be prepared and I get the idea that okay I can just sneak in no one's going to say anything but they did <laughs> they kicked him out <laughs> I was like oh boy and then the other news um you know was that Gronk Rob Gronkowski who retired has been saying that he could potentially make a return to the NFL. He was on Watch What Happens Live, teasing that he'd consider coming out of retirement and that he's feeling good and that he'd even consider going to Tampa Bay to reunite with Tom. And so I was trying to figure out, I know he did a deal with the WWE. I feel like I don't have any official knowledge, but I feel like it's a limited kind of situation right where he'll kind of pop in and do things like a a Brock Lesnar isn't there every day and every week or whatever so I feel like this could possibly happen especially if I don't know if Tom is really convincing I mean all the stuff with Tom moving to Tampa I'm sure he's excited about the chance to open a new chapter of his career. I mean, he's opened up about that and it's exciting to join a team to know that you can become a leader and potentially change the direction of that team. And if Gronk is, imagine him joining the Bucks, that could be the same kind of journey for him. And if the two of them are on that team, I'm going to have a heart attack. How do I not be excited to watch them? But like, become a Bucks fan. No, I will never not be. Never. Okay. 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 I mean, but that's kind of tough. If those two were together, that would be really hard for me. It would be very confusing. I think it yeah. would be it would be exciting to watch the Patriots kick their ass. It would be really very emotional. Yeah. It yeah. would be very confusing. So what I would do then would be I would be diehard Patriots. And then if the Patriots were out and Tampa was in, of course, I would cheer for them. And I don't cheer for anybody ever. Only so my team. You'd have your backup team. Yeah, you'd now have a backup team. I'd have a backup team. I just, I think Tom Brady should do Mass Singer though. If if Gronk's gonna follow in his footsteps, Brady <laughs> should follow in Gronk's footsteps a little bit. I'd love that. I know. Meanwhile, <laughs> I've been sitting here secretly hoping Kevin was gonna come in. So we, um, Kevin or Mister yeah. Patreon, Mister Patreon, Mister Morning Radio. Um, Kevin bought and he's been researching for weeks in this quarantine to buy a coffee maker for the house. Because now he's really into being a barista himself and he's thinking about the fact that he doesn't want to, right now he can't go anywhere to get anything, right? Because in our house with my mom and dad, we've just decided we're not going to buy anything from outside um, that we can't wipe down ourselves and um, not patronizing, being a patron, yeah, patronizing um, places. And so he decided to invest in a little coffee maker and he's like very excited. I'm very excited. We've been counting down the days for this coffee maker to arrive. It is finally here. I was telling Kevin if he comes in before 11:15, I could entertain the coffee. But now we're about to get into the interview with Martha, and I'm gonna have to wait till later. But I'm very excited about it because it's one of those that'll like grind the coffee fresh. Oh my gosh! I'm just wondering, Maria, if he catches you making him a coffee is he going to tell you all about after buzz and offer you to be a host there <laughs> <laughs> i know right like what are we going to do in this quarantine how are we going to find how are we gonna awesome... recruit more people yeah like how are we going to find the awesome people who are working at you know the the home depots and the and the starbucks of the world i know do you know my dad when i asked him on the easter zoom what his first thing he's going to do is at a quarantine he goes go to home depot <laughs> my dad my dad goes to home depot more than any employee ever in the history of home depot probably he it's, knows what he's getting but it's then his he favorite just gets place more. yeah it's his favorite place in the whole world i had a i was talking to him a little bit yesterday from six feet away maria thank you. i was keeping me keeping my distance thank you and it's just so interesting how he sees things it's just so cool how he's just like oh yeah you know take that you take it off you put a new one on you're good i don't know why i went italian with it but yeah you know, um it's just so cool how you can like things that normal everyday people walk by and they're like we don't even think about how that's built or how it's 
painted or how it's upkeep. Mm -hmm. And he's like doing the carport and you're just like, oh, it's rotted. Just going to pull it off, take a new one, put it on, new molding, done, paint it. You're like, you built the world, Costas. Yeah. I mean, he's Greek. Think about it. I want to buy him a candle that has the scent of Home Depot. <laughs> That's oh what we need. Oh, my God. That actually, so you know Dunkin' Donuts has candles that smell like coffee? I have them. They're amazing. They're my favorite candles. So a Home Depot candle, I would actually be into that, too. Like the smell of sawdust and stuff. I'd prefer it to the goop candle that somebody would get me. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Not interested in the vagina candle. All right. And on that note, um, let's get to our um, interview. I'm really, really excited to chat with um, Martha um, because she has, I mean, I went down the rabbit hole of of Martha articles and Martha videos and um, she has so much cool um just so much to share. Um, she's a New York Times bestselling author, like I said, a life coach, a speaker who specializes in helping individuals and groups achieve greater levels of personal and professional success. In addition to being Oprah Winfrey's life coach, she's a regular columnist for O, the Oprah Magazine, and a global thought leader on social change. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Martha Beck, how are you? Hi, I'm great. So happy to be here. So nice to meet you virtually. Yeah. Um, I was just telling everyone that ever since Elizabeth introduced you to me, um, I've been going down such a rabbit hole of, <laughs> of Martha Beck. And I just think, I mean, man, you have a lot of content out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a bit of a disorder. But Not it's like, disorder. <laughs> it's so helpful. It's like anything that I would ever need help on, there's a link to it and there's a video oh, and there's an article you. and it's so um, easy to consume, easy to digest, easy to apply, I feel like. Well, you're so kind. And thank you for all the amazing work you put out there. My God. Oh, Talk thank about you. Content. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, obviously you are in quarantine like the rest of us. And I wonder, I mean a lot of people are talking about making use of this time. And even other guests I've had are are talking about how they work with athletes and they're saying, let's win the weight. Um, How much of that should we be focusing on in your opinion? Well, we have a culture that is obsessive about forward progress and it doesn't really give us time to catch our breath. I think it's really ironic paradoxical that we are now afflicted with a virus that literally shows us that we can't catch our breath and and we need to lie down and catch our breath because other cultures traditional cultures see change as a cycle the way the seasons flow right our culture western european based cultures see it as a straight line going to better faster stronger and if there was ever a season to lie fallow it's this one So I used to try to, you know, when I was, I was chronically ill or stranded in the house for some reason, I would think I'm going to do all these things. And it was horrible. It was terrible. My life was trying to take me into a place of quiet. And so if you want to win the weight, I am so behind you. I will cheer with pom-poms. But personally, I feel like this is time to enjoy the quiet, to, to stop and catch my breath and see what comes up if I let the ground lie fallow for a little while. However, if you do take that route, like for example, my husband, he's like, he's the hustler, you know, we're getting left behind, whatever. And I'm like, everything is fine, honey. (laughs) All is well, all is it's supposed to be. And, And, you know, I, he'll look at me like I'm a little fruity. Um, but I do believe that, there should be a balance. And, um, and I feel like for him, he's like, everybody else is hustling. And if we don't, Mm -hmm. we will lose in the end and we will be miserable that we didn't fight harder in this time. What do you say to that? Well, it's so funny. I just finished a book. It's not out yet. It'll be out next year, but I talk a whole lot about the word hustle. And I say that you have a portrait of American society in one word. And here are the definitions I got from literal dictionaries. I'm not making this up. First one is what your husband is saying. Go out there, make things happen. Second one is 
move or force someone else to move very fast in a certain direction. Uh, a third one is to um, prostitute oneself. And the fourth is to cheat or swindle. So if you're running a hustle, you can see it in all of those things. And hustling is what we do as a culture. But you guys, it's taking us to the brink of destroying the ecology upon which our physical life depends. It has led to oppression of people of all sorts, ethnic varieties and, and genders Ooh. and everything. Just got the chills. It's not been perfect, right? Yeah. The hustle was not, it's, it's great at the, in the level where it's like, yay, we can do things. It's not so great, lower down in the definition list. So where has our culture been destructive and how can the rest from the hustle be constructive? That's the way I like to see this. So how do you coach people to rest? I mean, I've, I've studied Esther Hicks and, and the Wayne Dyers who are all about allowing, and I've incorporated so much of that into my life personally and balanced out the Tony Robbins and all of this, right? So it's like, sure. you need a Me little too. bit of everything, yeah. but it is scary when the rest of the world doesn't really abide by that theory and that kind of practice. And so you're like, okay, I'm over here allowing and surrendering and you all are hustling and pushing. You're not going to understand me. I'm not going to really understand you. So then how is anything going to move forward necessarily? Or are you going to go a different path? Well, um, my favorite uh, book in the world is the Chinese book, The Tao Te Ching, which was written uh, 2,500 years ago. And one of the things it says is that when nothing is done, nothing remains undone, which is a very un-Western way to see the world. It's very Chinese. And the idea is that when you get centered in yourself and you're living in balance with your heart, your spirit, your mind, all aligned, something works through you very powerfully and nothing is left undone. But you don't feel like you're forcing it. So I had to face this, you know, I, I got three Harvard degrees. I was a marathon runner, all this stuff. And then I got chronically ill for 12 years. I could barely get out of bed. And that's a long time to not be able to hustle. Yeah. But I can tell you that everything I've done that I consider to be worth doing came out of being forced to stop hustling and find who I really was. And then stuff just started getting done. So I'm so curious about your health journey because from what I read, and correct me if I have anything incorrect, which you know nowadays there are so many things that just keep getting spread, um, you recovered from depression, anorexia, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, I remember before my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer, that was the last appointment with the doctor. He said, now I'm going to test you for fibromyalgia. And I'm like, fibromyalgia? Yeah. My mom doesn't have whatever that is. Meanwhile, of course, she ended up with, you know, stage four brain cancer, which was a lot worse. Wow. And uh, she's still here and doing well. Thank God. Amazing. Um, but how did you recover from that? And how did you deal with 12 years of being grounded yeah, I actually had a few other diseases that were, fibromyalgia is kind of a grab bag, but they actually surgically ascertained that I had some other incurable and progressive autoimmune, autoimmune diseases. And yeah, 12 years was, it was, it was 12 years of my mind fighting to make my reality something different than it was. Yeah. And the more my mind insisted, that I do what my culture said to do, mm. the more my body said, no, you will do what nature says to do. Mm. So our whole culture is about, it's not in harmony with nature. It's not in our in, entire human culture. It's not in harmony with nature, but in our individual lives, it's not in harmony with nature. So instead of trying to please my culture, I finally gave up culture. I gave up. I said, anything I've been taught can go out the window as long as it heals me. This was the Mormon and, community you were a part of, right? That was a big part of it. Yes. Yeah. I was born and raised extremely Mormon in an extremely Mormon family. And it didn't work for me. And if it works for you, great, but it did not work for me. And leaving that meant leaving, um, you know, my family, my, all my friends from childhood, I was raised in a Mormon community and pretty much everything else, my job, my career, I decided I didn't like academia at about the same time. Wow. So quit that. And uh, well, actually, you know, it happened after I had, I got so sick that I had a surgery. And during the surgery, I had 
one of those experiences they talk about in near death circles. I wasn't nearly dead, but I was anesthetized and a light came into the room and I was fully aware and, and could look around the room even though my body was lying back. And this light appeared and it touched me and this exquisite comfort and peace came over me just beyond anything I can tell you. And somehow it communicated, this is how you're supposed to feel. Not after you're dead, but while you're alive. Do anything that feels like this. Don't do anything that doesn't feel like this. So I came out of that and quit my religion, my job, my friends, my family, like everything, my home, wow. my career. And just moving toward, I started moving toward that. And that's what I've been telling clients to do for 20 years. Does it feel wonderful? Do that. Does it feel horrible? Maybe don't do it. That's it. And they pay me. Yeah. <laughs> I never say anything else. <laughs> well, it's hard for people to to grasp all of that because they think, well, how am I going to make money? How am I going to survive? Because, you know, like like an artist, anytime a family uh, hears that their kid wants to be an artist, they're like, oh, you're never going to make any money. But that's what's going to feed their soul. And and so, how do you how do you coach through that? It's, it's always a bet. It's always, and I always do it with fear and trembling that with this person, it won't work, that they'll find their passion. They'll find their truth and they won't end up being able to prosper. Uh, because I don't really know how it happens to tell you the truth. It actually seems to be a kind of magic. And that's why people identify my work with the word magic a lot, but I don't believe it's magic. I just think it's something science hasn't yet explored, but when we come into our truth, the circumstances we create around us are very harmonious and resonant and money actually loves that money loves love mm. money doesn't love hate so if you're doing what you love where you love with people you love you're going to attract more love than if you're doing things you hate with people you hate in places you hate it it always works it's been thousands of people now and it seems to work That's yeah all i can say <laughs> i love that you know your your journey sounds um, reminiscent of Anita Morjani's. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've had her on the show before and talked to her and connected so deeply with her because right. she was going against the grain like most people. And I've read so many things now mm -hmm. of yours where you talk about this. And if you're going against the grain and the grain of your nature, your yeah. body is not going to respond well. So that's why you got the autoimmune diseases. And when you didn't listen yeah. to that, you got something else. And when you didn't listen to that, yeah. you got fibromyalgia. And when you didn't listen to that, until like God completely grounds you. And I think the same thing happened to me where I wasn't listening. I wasn't listening. I wasn't right. listening. And then I ended up with a brain tumor and it was like, okay, I hear you now. I hear you loud and clear. And it put me on a completely different journey and it's interesting to hear you say that about this time for people, um, yeah. that this is loudly speaking to everyone to to be still and to rest. Um, and to reevaluate, like, what have we been doing? One of the things I'm teaching this course called Practical Wayfinding, and one of the things that I just taught in it was look at something you've lost because of the pandemic. A lot of people, have, I mean, job loss is just horrifying. The economics are even more horrifying than the biology of it. But on the other hand, for 30 years, people have, the number one thing people have been telling me is I hate my job. Most of the jobs we have were based on a factory economy that treated people like machine parts and they're not conducive to human well-being. So, okay, your job's been taken away. That's awful. But think about the part of the job that was awful. And like flip it around, see if maybe you've been spared because that's what happened to me. I couldn't do the job I had decided I was going to do. And it turned out to enable me to do something I wouldn't have dreamed of. But first comes that flipping of perceptions. You got to let go of your attachment to something that was making you sick, whether it was in chronic illness or with a brain tumor like you, or if it was just making you feel bleh and horrible and leading to diabetes and heart disease or whatever. Think about what's worth losing. Like, let's not bring every part of it back. Let's just bring the parts that were nourishing us in the earth. And let's see if we can make that work. Because if it doesn't, then we're going to see more um, exponential growth curves. And they will have to do with the, the 
ability of the earth to sustain us. And it will be, uh, there's no waking up for, it'll be a wake up call, but we won't be around to see it. So like, what a brilliant opportunity. I was talking to someone who's been sick with this thing for three weeks. And she said, what an incredible opportunity to stop and evaluate what we were doing before and rejigger our lives so that they match what we always wanted in our hearts and maybe save the world. You know, that I would be agree. Nice. I agree. I had that time recovering from brain surgery to, to have those thoughts and to have those breakthroughs. And I, I want to understand more clearly because one of the things that I've been talking about every day here is if you have lost your job and if you don't foresee it coming back for a long time because that industry isn't going to come back because of the, you know, yeah. the side effects of this disease, this is your moment to perhaps look into finding a life coach that can help yeah. you find within you something you didn't know was there that you can pursue. Yeah. So when you say find the bad in the job, I mean, we all know most people hate their jobs. I've done segments on right. here before where I'm like, here are the 50 jobs you never knew existed that will make your heart <laughs> smile every day. Go hug pandas in China for a living or whatever, or test water slides. And, you know, these things actually pay. And so um, I, I think it's, I think it's great, but how does someone, how does someone do that? And, um, and I know you talk a lot about like turn devastation into transformation and that's what this yeah. is. Yeah. And, and what the methodology that I teach when I train life coaches is to utilize the worst things in your life to break out of the typical life pattern and create something that works from within. So we do one exercise that I call to hell and back. Um, it, any area where you've suffered and recovered, like you had your brain tumor and you, you, you've also had, you had your life on the red carpet, part of, probably saw, some of that was great for you. And some of it maybe not exactly what was right for you. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Again, Accurate. You should ask. <laughs> okay. So if you realized, if you woke up and went, oh, I didn't really like that. It caused me to suffer. And now I'm back. That's a place where you can lead others. And then you combine that with the 10,000 hours you've spent doing what you love most to do as a child. So I spent a ton of time reading as a child. I was especially interested in psychology. And so when I went to my Helen back experience, being so sick for so long, and I came back, I thought, well, I'll never forget. I had a therapist at the time and she said to me, I was finishing my dissertation for my PhD. And she said, how long has it been since you read a book for fun? And I was like, oh, right. That's a thing. You can do that. <laughs> so I bought a copy of Jurassic Park at the grocery store on the way home from my therapy appointment. And I hadn't, I'd been desperately ill, no energy for a long time, stayed up all night reading it, had a blast. And by morning, I knew I wanted to write books that people would read for fun. And it was so obvious. I'd been to that place with no fun. I loved books. All right, I'm going to make a book that is fun and maybe even brings people back from places that aren't fun. And every single life coach I train has a different Helen back and a different 10,000 hours. But if you put those two things together, you're addressing a pain point for a lot of people and you've got the practice to offer it. That's exactly what you guys are doing with producing this show. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. And that's why life coaching isn't like therapy exactly. I mean, part of it is helping people grieve and whatever, but then it like puts the building blocks of your life together and says, let's, let's make something that's economically viable, that's practical, that works with your family and that makes you happy. Yeah. That would work. And I think we could do it for the whole damn world if we just slow down enough. That's the key. And that's what I always would say to people. I'm like, how do I how do I teach people what I've learned without them having to have gotten a brain tumor, yeah. right? How do I share all of that? And now it's like everyone's in the midst of their brain tumor in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Everyone's forced yeah. to stop. Um, and they've been thinking about what you've said and it went right past them and they thought, oh, poor, I feel bad for people who get sick or who can't go out of the house or whatever it is. And then when it happens to them, something's like snags in their brains. I'm so interested by the way the things people have read or heard in their lives will come back into their attention at exactly the time they need it. The, the way the mind plays with that is so sophisticated. 
and you will just like the other day I had a really I had a scared day for all the people I know who are sick and for all the money people have lost and for the potential violence and all day all I could hear in my head was um, a song from Jesus Christ Superstar everything's all right yeah everything's fine and we want you to sleep well tonight. I was, and I just walked around the house and it just kept playing in my head. And I've learned that lyrics or fragments of poems or things I've heard people say on TV will come in like that insistently to tell me where I need to go psychologically so that I can create practically a, a life that works. Wow. Yeah, I, one of the things I thought was fascinating was um, it was an old, old video of you and Oprah where you were talking about how you can kind of size somebody up by finding out what room in their mm. house you would least like to have anybody come into. Right. And, and I sat in bed and I was struggling with it. I'm like, I don't think I have a room that, that I wouldn't want somebody to be in. Like I kept looking, I'm like, okay, I mean, maybe the dog room because the floors are a little like lifted because they've peed in there so many times. It's kind of like a little <laughs> not right. But yeah, I don't know. But that's why you're doing this. So all of you, viewers out there, if you just write a description of your house, like set a clock for three minutes, write a description of your house. This will be an analogy, a perfect illustration of your inner life. Because the way we choose things in our houses is a reflection of what we're feeling and thinking. So I can just walk into someone's house and walk through it and basically see what's going on inside them. And when I have people do this exercise, they'll say things like, well, the house is great, except for the bureau where my uh, husband keeps his work stuff. I'm never looking at that. And then you find out the, the husband's an embezzler. Or one woman told me she painted her entire house. Every room was either black or white. And she was very Ooh. religious and very like, there's right and wrong. And um, she actually said, the house is okay because sometimes I can go into the yard. <laughs> Wow. But she she thought in these black and white severe categories and then she broke through it, went on and became a, a life coach like, like me and uh, now has this house that she's decorated to fit her, the nature she had all along. But you don't have a room you hate. Oprah didn't have a room she hated because look at your lives, you know, but there may be a drawer, there may be a junk drawer somewhere that isn't your favorite whatever's your least favorite that'll yeah. be the place where you want to access and try to I feel it. like the only thing I just realized was my parents room because Ooh. I I didn't think of anything I thought of all my rooms and like everything that I have control over their room is the only mm. room actually mm. hmm. and isn't it so funny? the only place in your inner life where you might have some disruption so, the yeah. place where your parents live. Oh, yeah. Total like, disruption. Damn. So, there you go. Yeah. Wow. Always works. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably the area, you know, that I control, try to control so much as I try to control and their happiness, their health. No. And it's funny because, Martha, I actually highlighted a part of an article that I thought would help people so much. And it was, um, I believe it was the... Um, the lessons we need to unlearn. Oh, no, it was the um, the things that the advice everyone ignores but shouldn't. And it was mm. number five: free yourself from dysfunctional people by trying by refusing to try to control them. So, mm -hmm. not saying that my parents are dysfunctional, but um, but you admit that you're trying to control them a and billion that, percent. That's the only dysfunction you can handle, and that's the that's the messy room in your life. Yeah, and that's my roller coaster because I, I I go away from it and I get happy and then I get sucked back in and then I get unhappy and mm -hmm. it's that roller coaster. But this is the line. Oh my god, I labored for decades. This is you. I labored for decades to make sad people happy, rigid people flexible, aggressive people empath empathetic, and so on before finally noticing that one, this never worked, two, it drove me insane. Then I read codependency expert Melody Beattie's advice on how to deal with dysfunctional people, and it says, unhook from their system by refusing to change or influence them. Yep. Wow. It'll set you free. If this pandemic does nothing more for, me, for you than hearing you read that, it's okay. It was worth it. Right? So, yeah. It's a huge thing that people are trying to control each other like crazy right now to stay safe. And they're running into the truth that you really can't control anyone. And then, and that forced 
forces you to go inside and unhook, as Melody Baby so eloquently said. Yeah. Oh, I'm reading that immediately. Yeah. Um, but I think that that is such a hard thing for a parent with their kids, me parenting my parents. Um, and then I feel like I set a bad example sometimes because other younger people around me look to me and see how much I take care of them. And then they feel like they have to go to these crazy lengths. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm dysfunctional. <laughs> I don't think this is normal. Um, and, and it's cure, hard. The cure for trying to control people for codependency is to take your attention off the other person and put it on yourself, which most of us feel is selfish. Mm -hmm. When you go to a codependency 12 step group, instead of saying we're powerless over alcohol and our lives have become unmanageable, it's we are powerless over others and our lives have become unmanageable. It's a lot less fun than alcoholism because you never get to be altered. You're just like always trying to manage people and you're not, you don't get to drink. Yeah. Um, but you can do an exercise. Um, your producer, Jeff, and I were talking about, maybe you would like to do a little exercise. Yes. Up. How would you like to do one to sort of set you free from that? Let's do it. <clears throat> okay. So I've been, as I said, I've been teaching people to do this with all kinds of things that they've had to let go of because of the pandemic. Jobs was the one I just mentioned, but control over others is a big one. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you are um, you are trying to pull everyone you know up a mountain as you climb it yourself. And they're all in a big net that's attached to your belt. Mm -hmm. And you've got a rope and some carabiners and you're climbing up and they're all behind you. I know you this feeling feel very up. well. I'm yeah. very familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now um, imagine that lightning strikes you and it severs the rope that's hooking you to them. Ooh. And they all fall to their death. That's my fault. Is it? The lightning was your fault. Hmm. No. Are you sure? Well, it's my fault because I was holding on to them and not allowing them to have their own hooks and ropes. I, I just got off the phone with Liz Gilbert, who actually told you about me on and got this lined up. And we were talking about this very issue that we're both sitting around going, this is all my fault and I've got to fix it. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we're both in recovery. But imagining that really dramatic, they fall to their death, brings up the most dysfunctional thoughts that you have. The absolutely uncontrollable circumstance. It was either my fault that they fell or it was my fault that I was trying to drag them and they weren't there by themselves. Or it was, now here's the next part of the exercise and it may feel really selfish to you but it's the oxygen mask principle in the airplane. And, and in a time when we have a, a disease where people are dying of suffocation because they can't get oxygen, this is particularly apropos. So you're there on the mountain, Maria, and they've fallen to their deaths. There's nothing you can do about it. And you're thinking about what you did to them and how you could have done better, yeah? Now, this is the weird part. Imagine that in your mind, there's like, an angelic force. There is a force of truth. And it says, no, eyes on yourself. And you're like, but all those poor people, no, eyes on yourself. But they really should, no, eyes on yourself. It keeps you from expending all that energy outward. And weirdly, it will keep you from judging people because codependency, trying to help people too much, always turns into judgment and resentment. Always, every single time. Mm -hmm. So as we turn our attention back, what you'll see is, oh, if there's no one else in the world, I'm grieving, I'm frail, I'm scared. Okay, now that we can deal with. That we can work with because it's your truth. But everything that's about other people, it's just going to drag you backwards. Yeah. There's no way that you can live another person's life for them. No way. Yeah, and I think that especially in this crisis, um, there are so many people trying to control. I've heard it from so many people. My parents won't listen. My parents just are going out. They're not wearing masks or, you know, or the reverse, you know, parents with their kids. And it's harder for parents who have kids because it's your job yeah. to protect them. Right. Um, but even that you don't have complete control and the culture will tell you that you do, but every single person knows in their heart, the truth that we don't. So let me ask you this, Maria, if you put eyes on you, because you immediately said, this is your job. I'm thinking about all the people. 
that's your job. You think about all the people. Yeah. You're really good at it. You practiced it. It's your yeah. 10,000 hours. But what if I said, no, Maria, eyes on yourself. What's going on with you? You're the only person we can fix. You're the only person we can help. What do you need right now? What's going on in there? I need some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I need what some, great start. I need peace and quiet in my own house alone. Yeah, there's there's a lot I think I need. I think that my needs are always at the base. I mean, there's some superficial needs that get met. Like if I have back pain or whatever, I'll get a massage. I mean, obviously not in this time, but there are things that I'll superficially deal with if I have to. Right. But, you know, I I think that, it, you know, it's, you know, the loudest voice in the room takes the attention right away. And here's the irony. It is the oxygen mask principle. Yeah. The people, um, one of my favorite spiritual teachers, Byron Katie, said the amazing thing about the Buddha is that he only ever got one person enlightened. That's all he ever did, but he changed the course of history. You know, if you, if you actually do honor the nature that was born in you, not out of selfishness or narcissism, but because you are, to quote Mary Oliver, Oliver all you have to do is let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. If you start taking care of this soft animal and this soft heart, just you, what's amazing is the force or whatever you want to call it, works through you to create an incredible emanation of goodness and healing. So to the extent you're doing this to help other people, you probably are dimming your light. Mm. To the extent that you do this because you love it and you're taking care of yourself, you will get more and more visible, influential, clear, bright, and revelatory for many, many people. Yeah. It's this weird paradox. Put your own oxygen mask on first. I know. And when I'm good, Martha, I do it and I feel great. And I feel like I can fly to the moon with my own wings, like my own arms. But you know, then you get back <laughs> into the rut and you get like sucked back in and it's really, really hard. And so um, you well, know, the secret to that, it's just, it's just like learning to play the piano. It, once you've seen it, the rest is just mileage because there are literal, um, neuron pathways in the brain. So if you think of thought that you've thought a lot, like I need to control my parents. Okay. That thought is actually, um, conducted by these electrical signals in your brain that leap across, across these little gaps called synapses. And every time you think a thought, especially if you believe it strongly, a layer of this inert fatty substance called myelin wraps around that circuit, just like we wrap rubber or, or plastic around an electrical cord. It actually literally is a, an electrical cord. Every time you think that thought, especially with emotion, a new layer of myelin wraps around that circuit. And the effect is that you believe it more and it becomes more emotional to you. And it just go, it, so it's a self-reinforcing cycle. To stop it, that's why I said, no, eyes on yourself. It has to be this bang, come in and, and actually push your thinking away from the track it's used to and say, no, okay, let me think. What really happens when I exhaust myself is I can't be there for anyone. Mm -hmm. What really happens when I try to control people is I judge and resent them. What really happens, and it will actually be like trying to drive out of deep ruts in a road to create new pathways. It's hard. The only way it happens is if you just keep repeatedly questioning the beliefs that you know are, are already wrong. And if you do it enough, it, that first synapse withers and a new one comes in that says, my own oxygen mask first, right, I'm here to help everybody. Wow. I'm going to start practicing that. <laughs> yeah. it is, it's just like piano or horseback riding. Practice. Yeah. Um. There was another article that I really liked, and I had somebody on my show the other day who was talking about, I think it was Sophia Amoruso. I don't know if you're familiar mm, with her, yeah. the girl boss. She was talking about um, we're kind of a culture of burnout or something. Maybe it was her, maybe it was somebody else. But um, when I was reading your burnout list, I was like, oh, my favorite was when it was like when you hate everyone. Now, mm, I love yeah. people. I love being with people. Um, I love hosting. I love all of that. 
And I got to a place I remember where I'm like, I hate everybody. (laughs) And when I saw that, I was like, wow, I was really burnt out before all of this. And that's when, you know, God was like, you poor thing. Let's just give you a brain tumor and and put you to bed for a little while. Um, So that's why personal life. My personal life motto is cave early. Oh, like I like the that. moment I feel bad, I'm like, where is it? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off that. Yeah. And it always makes me feel better. Yeah. I think it's such a great practice, even in like little bits. Like I tell people when I start to kind of run red and hot, I'll mm-hmm. like go stop for a second and lay down, even for five minutes. And it just yeah. cools everything down and you feel better. I like yeah. cave early. I'm going to remember that. Um, the second it hurts, just stop. <laughs> yeah. So, so talk about burnout and then how do you effectively recover from burnout? Well, here's the thing I think is, that it, I, is unexpected about burnout. It doesn't, I don't get burned out. I didn't get burned out because I was doing what I was born to do, but doing too much of it. It was because I was doing what I was not meant to do. Mm. So what happened is my deep sense of truth had a path ahead of me that it knew it wanted. And my mind got sucked into several aspects of my culture, religion, academia, different things like that. And so I went with the mind while my truth went on a different road and it split me. And the way, so the book I just wrote is called um, The Integrity Clan, unless they rename it. It's about how you take all the pieces of yourself and make them one. That's what integrity means, Mm -hmm. one thing, integer. And so if you want to get a lot more energy, Don't just keep doing what you hate and then lying down to recover from it. That worked for me for a while, but it's never enough. Start to question the things you're doing that you don't love and stop doing them forever. Don't just lie down for five minutes. Find the thing you love. Because I went from 12 years of being almost unable to function at all, couldn't move my hands, couldn't do anything. When I got, I came out of that surgery, started doing only what I loved, and suddenly just healed and started being really productive. And, and, but I wasn't even aware of being productive. I was just sort of, I'm like a, I was like a surfer on a wave. The wave itself was pushing me forward and I was just balancing and it was easy. It was restful. So that's what I would say is don't just take five minutes off the thing you hate. During those, those five minutes, acknowledge that you don't love that and that you're being split from your heart, from your soul, from your truth, and then start to find your way back a little at a time. I still can't believe you went on a 12 year health journey. That is, that is intense. It sucked. How, it frankly sucked. how did you go from that to Oprah? Do you mind me asking? <laughs> you know what really happened? I went skiing. I, I wrote a, I, people started coming and asking me for advice and I couldn't understand why they would do that. So I wrote a book to give them so they would leave me alone because I genuinely am an introvert. And the book backfired horribly and they kept coming to see me. And the Oprah show called me and uh, they said, we need uh, to talk to some experts on de-stressing your life. And I said, that sounds nice, but I'm going skiing. Goodbye. And Apparently the producer, she later told me she'd called like 19 so-called experts. I was among them. And she said, your response was the only one that didn't sound stressed. And so they actually, a friend actually came out and found me on the ski slope by the lift and handed me a cell phone. And it was the Oprah show. And they gave me a whole hour um, wow. to, to plug this book that I wrote so that no one would uh, bother me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Isn't that so funny when, but you also, it wasn't that you didn't sound stressed. You were living what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. And I so you were the only one of all those people that were actually living your truth and, and your, your message. And so that meant you were the most authentic. Um, I think that's probably true. That, that ring of truth, when somebody's telling the truth, being authentic, it really appeals to all of us. Yeah. And, and not desperate. You- once you do it, once you get back into doing only what you love, there's such a strong resonance from the people around you that everyone needs this right now. As I said, we've been in a factory-based economy at least since the, the, um, the Industrial Revolution, and we've been treated like tra- factory pieces, and it, nobody likes it, nope. and it's not authentic. So we're desperate for authenticity. So when you get up there and you're so authentic, everybody goes, her that whatever she's doing, I want that. 
And if you do that, no matter who you are, or what you do, I promise you, there are ways people will pay you to bring that kind of value to this world. Yeah. And that light too. Yeah. So how did you transition into being her life coach? I was never Oprah's life coach. It's more like Oprah likes to say, uh, she tells a story about when she was a, a little girl and her grandmother worked for some white people down the way. And one day her grandmother was boiling the laundry in a big pot over a fire with a, poking it with a stick. And she said, now you watch Oprah because um, when you grow up, you're going to have to do, you're going to have to do this. And Oprah thought she was four. She thought, oh, I'm going to have people doing that for me. And then her grandmother said, I just hope when you grow up, you can get yourself some good white people like my white people. And Oprah would look around the room and go, I think I got me some pretty nice white people. Um, you know, and it's, we're, I, I wasn't her life. I was the life coach that belonged in her stable. <laughs> and um, basically, uh, I have been writing for the magazine for 20 years. And um, she is lovely. And so she reads my column first and um, learns from it. But that, wow. she doesn't need a life coach. That's so funny. So I had the same thing when I was young. My mom, both my parents are Greek immigrants. And my mom would be like, mm. Mari, you got to learn how to clean the house for your husband. And you got to learn how to cook and this and that. And I was like, mm, no, I'm going to have people do that for me. <laughs> I'm like, mom, I'm going to have a housekeeper. And I said everything. I was like, I'm going to live in a house that's so big. It's going to look like the White House. And oh, awesome. I had very vivid plans. And then one day, I'll never forget it. We were in the house. And the housekeeper walked by and I go, oh, holy shit, it happened. And then when yeah, we bought right? our house, I bought a house. It looks like the White House has the pillars. I, it was oh not planned. God. I didn't say, oh, I said when I was a little girl. It was later after I bought the house. I go, oh, my God, it happened. And, right. And it happened because you got back in touch with your integrity, which is also your intuition. So when I was growing up, my my I had seven siblings and we were poor and we had this ratty house and we were so ashamed because all the popular kids lived in this division called oak hills and all i wanted was to live in oak hills and then i outgrew it and i went off to the world and i and when i was 50 i, I became obsessed with owning a piece of wild land so i bought a, a ranch in california and i went out there and it was all an oak forest and um 20 species of oak and I would hike through it every day and one day I looked around and I went oh my god I own oak hills <laughs> right <laughs> right I didn't mean that to happen yeah that's the magic and and that's the thing Maria I can't draw a straight sort of Newtonian physics line between the heart expressing itself and the physical circumstances aligning I just know that it happens but it's not like the secret where you just say you want something and boom it's there you have to actually be in touch with your truth. Yeah. Something that's not true for you won't manifest. But if it's deeply true, no matter how wild it sounds, it does. That's a great distinction. Yeah. It's the whole reason that not everybody wins the lottery. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my God. I could talk to you for hours. And I have a million more questions. So I feel like... If you would do us the kindness at some point to come back. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, because I would love to. I want to talk about so many more things, but I don't want to take up all of your time today because I'm sure you have a million other things to do and I want to be respectful of your time. But man, I am so grateful to know you. Um, thank you. You too. And if, also Jeff, your wonderful producer. Thank oh, you. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, uh, just such a joy. If I could ask one last question, we ask all of our guests at the end, what is one thing you're doing to get better at anything in life right now? Um, I am, I have learned something that is blowing my mind. I have recently learned to go to sleep. <laughs> I am not, not kidding. I've had the worst insomnia. They gave me an insomnia drug that has never failed with anyone. I had to lie down in the position I wanted to sleep in, take this stuff. And they said within five minutes, you will be out. You won't remember anything. Um, 45 minutes later, I got up and started teaching my, myself to play the ukulele to see if I really was not laying down memory track. This stuff, I could not sleep. Wow. And that led to a lot of my health problems. And then I found medication that helped. But my, ins my insomnia came back during the pandemic. And I would lie in bed worrying about everybody, everybody, everybody. And then I started doing this exercise. No, only eyes on yourself. 
And I started looking for what in my body felt peaceful, felt relaxed. And the idea is I just focus on what feels relaxed. You loosen the muscles of your face first and you feel the pleasure of that. And you, you become like a cat or a dog, just enjoying the selfish pleasure of your muscles relaxing. And if other, the thought of other people comes up and I think I have to help them, I say, no, eyes on me. And I've been sleeping like you wouldn't believe. And I just wake up so refreshed. It's like I'm aging in reverse. I'm loving this so much. 57 years old, I'm finally learning what new babies know. And um, I think it could probably help you too, Maria. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sleep would be so nice. I'm, I'm very interrupted with my sleep, not going to lie. Well, this disease is teaching people to sleep, I'll tell you. Yeah, I think I need to do the routine. We had um, Yogi Cameron on yesterday, and we were talking about um, uh, a sleep pattern and waking mm. up at the same time and going to sleep at the same time. So I got to I gotta focus on that. It really is the weirdest thing. We are a culture that um, is, goes crazy for progress and doesn't know how to sleep. And I've been one of the worst offenders, but it sounds like maybe we're all going to be shaken to our senses now. I sure hope so. Martha Beck, thank you so much. So lovely to chat with you and to know you. Thank and, you. It's um, wonderful to be here. I'm so grateful for the work you guys are doing. Thank you. Well, we will see you soon. Okay. Take Until care next and time. Stay well. You too. Bye. Oh my God, I love her. I know. Love her. I mean, I, I, if I didn't have a call in a few minutes, I literally would have talked to her for two hours. Well, no, I wouldn't be rude. I didn't want to keep her all the whole time, but ah she's amazing I just found myself getting emotional frequently during the interview i don't know maybe i need a little more sleep i don't know what it is but i'm very very moved by everything she has to say yeah me too you know, they call it the magic and like i, I kind of sense some of that she the thing i so appreciate and you touched on at the top maria is it seems like she does have a very definitive and concrete response or practice for any question you'd have yeah. When you research you know? her, oh yeah, there's like something for every issue, period. Mm -hmm. Any of your issues, look at Martha Beck, start reading through, you will find the answer. Um, I'm so, so excited that we got to do that. Um, thank you guys for joining us as always, wherever you're watching us, YouTube, Facebook, Insta Live, whatever. Um, and if you loved the episode, share it with a friend. There was so much information in here that I think can be helpful to, to people. So please share it, um, and social it out, whatever you do to, to get it in the hands of the people that need it, rate, comment, subscribe. Um, all of that is really helpful. Um, I was just going to ask Jeff, I uh, felt like, I felt like a this. So you look through the window and I'm just like, <laughs> uh, Jeff, I want to know how people can get involved in our show for Thursday Yes, with Tony Robbins. Yeah. So we have the Tony Robbins show this Thursday. I'm thinking we're going to do a three level of eligibility for some of the giveaways we have. It sounds like um, there's going to be the chance to work with one of Tony's life coaches for a free session, which is amazing. Um, so there's one of three ways to be eligible for the show. One, Maria is going to post today a photo of her and Tony promoting the show. If you share that photo with three people, we will enter you into the eligibility to potentially get a free coaching session with one of Tony's coaches. Um, we're looking for great questions on that post as well. So if you submit a question and engage with the photo in that way or an iTunes review. So we'll be looking through all of those. Just make sure on the iTunes review, you leave your Instagram handle and that way we can get in touch with you for the eligibility. Oh, good works. point, Jeff. That is such yes. a good detail. Very important. Okay. Yes. So do these things um, to um, enjoy some of the giveaways because I know there's uh there might be some more in there we're working on as well um in the meantime if you haven't migrated over to patreon please do we have another amazing episode this week so join us the link is in the summary in the meantime to stay up to date with martha and her endeavors you can follow her on instagram at the martha beck b-e-c-k twitter at martha beck at maria Meninos, at steve lemieux photo at jeff crane graham and remember be nice people make good choices and be present